Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today I'm very happy and excited to have Gary Meyer join us. I've known of Gary, not known him personally, but known of him since I was a teenager when I was listening to the Stephen Gary show on The Loop in Chicago, which is a pretty big radio station, and he was a pretty big deal. And actually, it still remains a pretty big deal. Uh, he's been in radio for decades, like 30 some years, I think at least. Mm -hmm. He has been inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame. He was voted number 32 out of 100 of the most influential talk show hosts in America. He was voted one of the heavy 100 talkers of all time by Talkers Magazine. He has five AIR awards for best afternoon talk show. National Radio and Records Award for Best Local Afternoon Talk Show Host. The It just goes on and on. It's really impressive. And oh, did I also mention he's got an Emmy for TV production of Greetings from Graceland. Gary, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you, Stefan, for the invitation. And not to be humble or whatever, it's not false humility. All those awards are in a box and I don't even know where that box is. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to uh, get rid of them or shy away from those. I'm honored that I got them. It's just that I always feel like, hey, I just do what I do, and I'm happy that those things came along. Yeah. So let's kind of rewind to the beginning. And how did you end up like getting paired up with with Steve Dahl and have having the Stephen Gary show? And like, how how did this all come about? Did you guys? Uh, know each other beforehand? I don't think you did, right? I know you and I talked about this before we taped the show here. And we were talking about, is life random? Is it kismet? Is it chance? What are your beliefs? And you got to, at one point or another, put your money on one of those things. I'm more or less putting my money on, it seems like fate has played a hand most of the time in my career. What happened there was I was working all nights at the loop radio station that you mentioned. And the station in the meantime, about halfway into my run there, about six months into my run, halfway into the year of it being sold, I heard that the station was going to change hands. And then I thought, well, in the past, when I've heard about a radio station being sold, they usually get rid of everybody, change formats, any combination of those things. But I thought, I'm on the all-night show. I'll be the last person they're going to worry about. It's not the most profitable day part of the radio station. So I'll just sit here and see what happens. In the meantime, Steve was doing a morning show at another station. He had come in from Detroit, and I would listen to him on my way home after I got off the air at 6 a.m. He was just starting at his station. And I'd listen to him, and I thought, huh. This is interesting. I've never heard any radio quite like this. He was doing all these character voices. And I just filed it away and thought, okay, interesting. And then his radio station changed format and he left. It went from rock and roll to disco and he didn't fit that format. So he left. And then the consultant who was in charge of the radio station I was working at was hired by the new owners. They kept the format as it was, but they decided to hire Steve to do mornings. So he would start at six. I was ending at six. And knowing what I did about him from listening to his show before, one morning as he was starting, I threw something out to introduce him to say, hey, get ready. It's Steve Dahl's first day or whatever that was. And I said something. I think it was Steve saw gasoline priced at 79.9 on the pump in his neighborhood. He's going to talk about it. And... When he heard that, he was standing behind me before he went home, before I went home, he was going on. He thought that was an interesting thing to say. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of days, I'd throw a few more things out when we were transitioning. And then by the fifth day, he said, stay, we'll talk. And then we did that for a week. And then the program director was listening and thought, this is chemistry. And he put us together. And that's how that worked. Oh, wow. What, what, a, <laughs> what a great... Uh... Yeah. Kismet is a, is a good word, I think, for that. <laughs> and did you live in Chicago? How did you know about this? Uh, I lived in the summers in Chicago. 
uh, during the, the school year, I was in Toledo, but I, I had okay. uh, friends and family in, in Chicago. I stayed with the friends and, and visited my, my aunt. Um, yeah. So I would go there every summer for like four years and uh, listen to the Stephen Gary show. <laughs> and how old were you at the time? Um, I was a teenager. I was probably okay. 14, That's all I 15. need to know. Yeah. Did your aunt say, whatever you do, do not listen to these guys. They're evil. <laughs> no, she didn't even know anything about them. But okay. the, my friends who I stayed with, um, they were big fans. In fact, I was just talking with, uh, with her, uh, uh, her name is Pam just the other day. And she was at one of your very first um shows there were only a few hundred people there it was you and steve and I, I i forget where it was at but she she had told me and it was amazing and hilarious and and uh it was one of your very early it might have been your very first show uh, together that you guys did first remote where she could attend yeah yeah we did a lot of those early on where we'd go to a movie theater and then invite people in. And the show started at, I believe, 5 at that time. And there would be, you said, only a few hundred people. But you have to realize that this is 530 in the morning. To get several hundred people to get up and come down to see a radio show, we were pretty excited to have that kind of following. And I remember one distinctly. I might be getting ahead of your questions here. But from that, you triggered something. We would do our show at the Carnegie Theater in Chicago. It was a movie theater. And one morning, we're doing the show. We're about a half hour, 45 minutes into the show. And during a break, I go out to the lobby. And John Belushi is standing there. They were filming the Blues Brothers movie at the time. And they had just finished filming for the night. And he wandered over. And I said, hey, you want to come up and be on the show? He said, sure. So he walks in. And of course, at that, that time, if you know who this man is, this guy was one of the biggest people in show business. And he sat with us for about an hour on the show. And it was one of those things where you're just thinking, wow, this is incredible. This yeah. is all coming together so well. Amazing. So who was the very biggest uh, guest that was ever on your show? Well, it's, it's a hard question to answer in that a lot of people were big stars, but Maybe they didn't hit the same way other people did where I became friends with certain people. I think if I'm going to go with the list of if you're categorizing people and celebrities, we had Paul McCartney on the show several times, and that was via phone. Now, I did meet him after that in person, and it was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. If you've ever met a person of that star quality, there's an aura around them when they walk into a room. And now you know why they become superstars because of that aura. It's hard to describe unless you've experienced it, but it's there, I think. And I was a huge Beatles fan. So for me, that kind of connection to talk to him on the phone even was something that I would never forget. Now, there are other celebrities that I became friends with. The actor Brian Dennehy, who sadly passed away this year, he and I became friends after he came on the show and then we keep in touch. And then we became very close friends. The comedian Richard Lewis and I became close friends. That kind of stuff happened because of the radio program where people come on the show and I'd start some kind of conversation off the air. And then it developed into a, a very valuable to me a friendship, not because they were celebrities, but because of the kind of person they were. And I just was excited that I got to meet them through the radio station and become friends. Yeah, that's awesome. So who Who's been the most life-changing uh, person that you've met because of uh, the radio and, and the podcasting uh, that you've done? Life-changing. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a tough one in that I think when you establish a very deep friendship with somebody, you and I know somebody, his name is Ken Rakowski, yep. and he heads up this group called Metal, and we're both part of that. I met Ken 30 years ago because he invited me on a radio show he was doing and we became friends. And then he went on to do these incredible things that he's doing today. And I think as far as being a center where I'm orbiting around his universe and meeting 
different people, including yourself. He's probably one of the most valuable people because he's so life affirming. And also technically, this guy is, as far as my knowledge of technology, he's light years ahead of me. And he would help me along because I'd be stumbling along trying to figure things out. I'll never forget the day he goes, come on over to my apartment. I want to show you something. And he opens his computer. Now this, it's hard to believe that computers didn't have audio at one point, but they didn't. This is before audio. And he said, listen to this. He plugs a microphone into his computer and he dials on the keypad and he's talking to somebody in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's a wizard. He's a witch. I don't know. Should I burn him? Should I do? <laughs> because he knew way before things were coming, he would already be plugged in literally to them. And he blew my mind over and over again. And with these, I don't know if he calls them seminars. I think he's very particular about what he calls these meetings that he has, but the people that are involved are very inspiring. And to yeah. be part of that every week just makes me feel like I've won the lottery. It makes me feel that I've won the lottery where yeah. I get to be with these people. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's quite a connector and he's, uh, got, got just so much knowledge and, and, and wisdom under his belt. Yeah. So he's, he's a great guy. Now, what would be an example of a, an interview or a show, <laughs> uh, just a, a morning show that went really sideways and, and had some profound negative impacts, um, maybe even career changing impacts for you? I decided early on that when things go south, I have 10 minutes of material. If things go well, I got eh, almost nothing. I've decided that I don't look for things to go south, but when they do, got material. Okay. That's the fun stuff to work with. And there's really nothing in the last 30 years where I went, oh man, that was bad because I enjoy even working my way out of the wreckage. If there is in fact wreckage, the fun part is trying to come out of it and, and not be too scorched mm -hmm. in the process. But to answer it in a more specific way, we did this event in 79 called Disco Demolition, where we blew up these disco records at a ballpark and fans ran on the field and started fires and it became quite <laughs> the thing. And we went back on the air and we were having fun with it. And we were there at this radio station, The Loop, about two years from that big event. And the station decided that we were all of a sudden violating community standards and they fired Steve and I quit in solidarity. Wow. And that was one of those things where you were not expecting it because we were probably the best rated show on the station. And that turned out to be an interesting marker because I have been at radio stations where I had incredibly great ratings and they pulled the plug and there's no reason. I don't think they knew. They just did it. And there's a series of this, not only with me, but with other people. And it's a very weird business and turned very weird, I think, about 15 years ago. I got to enjoy it in its zenith through the 80s and most of the 90s. But in the early 2000s, things turned. And it's not the business that I enjoyed from before. Mm. Now, uh, things have uh, uh, been interesting in, in your career. And uh, one thing that I, I learned about Steve, I didn't know when uh, I was listening to you guys on the radio, but um, uh, Pam told me that mm -hmm. uh, he was an alcoholic and uh, it was pretty obvious. Like he, he would uh, show up drunk for the, the tapings and stuff. And I think he was pretty rip roaring drunk that time that uh, she saw you guys live. And I'm curious how that impacted your guys' poor and the, the show itself and the longevity of the show, like, uh, was this problematic for, uh, from your standpoint? Well, yeah, because it ended the partnership. It eventually yeah. blew the whole thing up. You can only go so long with those situations before it's impossible to work with as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, yeah uh, he was 
he was a drinker from the beginning, but you thought, well, that's going to solve its own situation. And it's not something that I'd be concerned with right now, but it kept going and going and then it gets tedious. And then you think, well, how long do I want to put up with this? And then there are moments where it gets ugly, things are said, and the damage is done. And that's the short explanation of it. But it, it did end the partnership of almost 15 years. Yeah. And he would not admit to me that he was having a drinking problem. He claims he, when I had the come to Jesus speech with him privately at the end, he pretty much said, that's not a problem. And when they don't even want to recognize it, there's nothing else I can do. Right. Yeah, that's the that's the thing about alcoholism is the 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 folks who are in the middle of it don't recognize it. They don't see it. But, you know, the expression, I don't know who discovered water, but it per, pretty much wasn't a fish. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> OK. And yeah. when he said that it wasn't a problem when I had that final meeting with him after I left, he stopped drinking and said he's not drinking anymore. And I was thinking, well, if you thought it wasn't a problem, why did you stop drinking? And I, I guess he, in his head, decided, well, it was just better for me health-wise. But I don't know if he ever admitted fully that it was an issue for anything. Whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I did do my research before this uh, interview to see where things ended up with him. And uh, apparently he's sober. And uh, I, I saw some stuff like Alcoholics Anonymous and things that he was involved with. So, yeah, I think he ended up clean. I'm glad that that, that was the outcome. So one thing I've, I've, I've heard uh, about you is you're pretty careful to not talk too much about your personal life on, uh, on the radio. And is that something that is just you protecting your privacy or is it you don't want to use family as, as fodder for, for the material because you're pretty funny, you're quite funny. Uh, uh, and, and so you, you don't want to have family members be the butt of jokes or like, I'm, I'm just curious what the impetus was for that. I think it's yes to, I think you made two statements there. I, it is yes on both of those levels. I just don't, feel that they should be drawn into something where they don't have a rebuttal, a chance to, if they find it not suitable for them, they don't have the microphone. And that's not fair as far as I'm concerned. Those who do it and are comfortable with it, fine. They've made some pact with the people they're doing it with, I think, and everybody seems to be okay with it. But then if you've ever watched the Howard Stern movie, Private Parts, they portray his first marriage where he's doing all this stuff on the radio and she's upset when he comes home and it doesn't always land properly. If you're the one being talked about and you're listening to it on the radio, it's, it's a little uncomfortable and I don't want to put family members through that. So that's something I've stayed away from. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, there was, there was somebody that you worked with for a while. I didn't know about this person, but uh, Elton Jim was his name. And you guys had a lot of chemistry and kind of uh, poor on the radio when you guys uh, were, were doing stuff. And I just want to hear more about how that relationship kind of came about and uh, what were some of the lessons and and some of the magic moments uh, from that partnership? Well, that was less of a partnership than the Stephen Gary thing. He was basically a hired hand and a contributor to the program. It wasn't a partnership in the true gotcha. sense. Gotcha. He called the show one day and added into something I was talking about. And then I think he was a frequent caller. And I thought, well, he seems to have a lot of knowledge about show business. And I think I made it a feature where he would do show business talk once a week. And then I had this radio show come about where I thought he could add to that. And this radio station, they wanted you to work, as they say, the board, meaning you run your controls, you do the commercials, you fire up the microphone. And I always thought I'd rather not have to do that because I'm trying to think of what I want to talk about for four hours. And how about if I bring him in and he could do that 
and also contribute. It was covering a couple bases that I wanted covered, mainly the one of not running my own board. And he did that and it worked. But then the station is one of those things where show's doing great. Let's pull the plug on it. And this is great business. Mm, bummer. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do after that. So it basically ended there because I went into the podcast and it was just a different rhythm. And I set it up the way I've set it up where I didn't really need that kind of input. And that was that. Gotcha. So uh, why was his nickname Elton Jim? No. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> because he is a, a super Elton John fan. In fact, he's seen Elton almost 200 times in concert. And he has a lot of Elton memorabilia. And he's just obsessed with Elton John. So I thought as a nickname, I'd call him Elton Jim because it flowed just like Elton John. And he loved it because he loves Elton John. And by saying that he's a super fan, it was, I believe, MTV that did a program on the super fans of Elton John. And he was in the top five. Okay. Or VH1. One of those channels did it. And he was in the top five and he's got a Elton John pinball machine and all this other paraphernalia. And oddly enough, no kids. So I don't know who's going to enjoy that when he's gone. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do you figure out what to talk about for four hours without having a, a script or like a, a whole itinerary or agenda or anything like what do you just riff on whatever the morning's news headlines were or like wh where do you get your material i think when i had a partner we would know each other so well that we brought stories in our head to the show and then started talking and then we would volley back and forth that way when i went on my own <clears throat> my producer would hand me stories to take into the studio. I'd look over them and then I'd grab about 10 that I thought I could play with. And on the radio, you're constantly taking phone calls. So you have that, that input from the listener. And sometimes you'll have a topic, you'll open the phone lines up, they'll call in and then they'll say something that takes you in another direction. And then you start following that because that seemed interesting. And that's the way the rhythm worked on the radio. On the podcast, I'm doing five shows a week Three of them are 30 minutes long and two are an hour long. The two hour long shows are paid subscriptions. And it's the same thing. My producer will send me stories. I'll look at them and then I'll come up with some other stuff. And it's a different format because you're talking through the whole half hour or hour. There's no stopping for news, traffic, weather, none of that radio formatic bullshit. And we just do it. And it just kind of flows in that direction. And I don't have any phone calls because they're taped, except I do a live show on Friday where people can call in if they want. But the Monday through Thursday shows are taped, so I don't have listener input that way. I look at texts and things, but not a live phone call. So it's a different animal and a different muscle that had to be exercised to do the podcast. But I'm enjoying it because it's a lot freer than being in a radio format. I just like the rhythm of it. So you've been doing the podcast for how, how long? Almost six years. Six years. And is it as rewarding as being on the radio or do you miss the radio more? Okay. Everything has a trade-off. No matter what you get that you think is better or a step up, it's going to have a trade-off of something that was good in what you gave up, but you had to give it up. In this case, I had to give up the big audience, that radio shows have if they're successful because with podcasting here in radio i had maybe i had maybe two or three competitors in podcasting what are there a million and a half podcasts so you're in a deep pool and you have yeah. to try to pull yourself above that pool and that's where the challenge lies it doesn't have the same revenue stream unless you can get to these certain numbers Yes, I miss the bigger audience and the revenue that would be available, but this is what I wanted to do now. I'm not opposed to doing a radio show podcast hybrid. I think those two would work really well together. 
Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm kind of looking at right now to have both in concert. And one would feed off the other. Right. Kind of like uh, a show like Hidden Brain, for example, that's on NPR on Sunday evenings, but it's also on on uh, podcatcher apps and people are probably as much consuming it via uh, podcast as, as they are listening on the radio, I would imagine. NPR has really found a way to do podcasting. They really have that down. And I applaud them for getting to where they have. And yeah, because they've got the radio shows going and they've got that, that podcast rhythm going too. Mm -hmm. And it works really well. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Alex Bloomberg left NPR and uh, started the startup podcast and uh, reply all. And he created the whole Gimlet Media podcast network, which I think sold for something like 600 and some million dollars. Uh, I forget who bought that. Was it Spotify or something? But, yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Uh, he's, he's an impressive guy. So what would be some of the lessons that you have learned from podcasting that you would want to share with our listeners? Because our listeners, of course, are podcast consumers. And what do you think would benefit them to know? Well, I don't know if I can add any benefit as far as what they don't already know. But I do know that podcast listening is different than radio listening. This is, you listen to it when you want to listen to it. This is the way things have shifted over the years with consuming television and movies and everything else. It's at your schedule that you take in these shows. And that's the beauty of them. Plus, they're kind of built for, say, a, a car trip or a, a plane trip where you put them in and you listen to them. They go for a half hour, hour, whatever they go for. They're, they're really designed for that kind of listening. And radio is designed for you're in your car, you push a button, you hear a segment, maybe they go to a commercial, you leave. And if you're listening to a music station, you listen to a song, they go to a commercial, you leave, you come back, whatever. This is more compact. And I think that appeals to a lot of people. It's just that, as I said, there are a lot of choices. Now, having said that there are a million and a half podcasts, 500,000 of them are serial killer based. They talk about serial killers. That's what it seems like. And then 200,000 are gardening shows. And then it starts trickling down from there to general entertainment. I think a lot of these podcasts are hobbyists because the entry level is really low. You get anybody and everybody that has a podcast. And that's what floods the pipeline. The challenge is, again, to pull yourself out above the hobbyists and everything else and come up with something unique. And a lot of people have done it. It's just, I find it to be the biggest challenge of this against radio. And if your listeners listen to a lot of them, that's cool. But they found that it's a small percentage of the shows that get listened to a lot. It's one of those things. I went to a, a convention a few years ago. They were talking about podcast versus radio listening. And they were going on and on about the listenership of radio is still strong and this and that. And I raised my hand and I said, wait a minute, radio has been around for 95 years. Podcasting is what, about 10 years old, let's say? You're comparing apples and oranges here. Yeah, if I had a 90 year head start, I, I hope I would be at a certain level uh, that they are at and podcast is still to reach that level. We both know from this meeting we attended on Saturday that Radio took, it was 32 years to reach 50 million people. And then Facebook took nine months to reach 100 million people. So that's the way things are going now. This is how this, this flows. Yeah. And, and what would you say is the differentiator or the value prop for listening to your show versus other uh, podcasts? Because there are so many of them to choose from. Well, I think I do something unique that a lot of other shows don't do. I don't do any politics. I focus mostly on a lot of this nonsense that we see day in and day out. And I crack wise on that. And I have a woman on who does, well, our version of news. It's not the traditional news you would hear on a radio station. But she picks out some goofy stories and then we riff on those. And it's 
I think designed to make you feel good, laugh, whatever, in a sea of what has been a hellish year. But I would do this no matter if it was a pandemic or not. My style is my style. And I didn't do politics the last four years just because of the last four years. I've never done it. It's not a cop out because, oh, I don't like what's going on in Washington since 2016. I never did it. And I think I'm in step with people who go, I'm exhausted by this. I don't want to listen to another story about what's going on with the election or whatever. And that's where I come in, where I don't do that. And I focus in on the silliness of just being on this planet. Right. And, and uh, you wrote a piece uh, I really enjoyed on, on your blog about uh, 2020, the fall will probably kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That was back in August. And uh, do, do you want to share some, some thoughts about that now that we're a few months past when you wrote that? Okay. Can you refresh me? Because I do, do a new blog about every two weeks. And I remember the line. The line is from the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Right. I think you're referring to our situation in the pandemic. Yep. If you could refresh me. Anyway, in the movie, uh, Butch and Sundance are pinned down by the posse and they're on the edge of a cliff and their choices are to shoot it out or to jump into the ravine below that has maybe two feet of water. And those are your choices. And Paul Newman, his character, Butch, says to Sundance when he, Sundance says he can't swim, oh, don't worry about it, the fall will probably kill you. <laughs> and at some point, they're talking about this vaccination and it's, going to be out soon, but will it be tested enough to know that it's safe? And it's a rock and a hard place situation where the COVID numbers are skyrocketing again. And what are your choices in life? Really take the best road you can take because the fall will probably kill you. I don't remember the exact gist of that blog. If you can. Yeah. Well, he, in, he, I'll your first line was November 3rd could be the ignition point. <laughs> I oh, hope I'm okay. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I kept thinking as things were boiling, no matter which way the election goes, this could erupt. I was very happy to see there was no eruption. Obviously, there's still a lot of weirdness following the election. But so mm -hmm. far, my predictions of eruptions, I thought there might be an eruption around June 1st, because people have been out of work for months by that point, and all of that. I'm fairly excited that we've been able to keep our wits about us. And this will straighten itself out as things usually do. And I look up into the universe at night when I walk my dog into the sky and look at all that's going on there. And I think, we're just a blip. There's nothing we can do. It's, it's already out of our hands. We're on this ball, it's spinning around. And if the universe decides it wants to do something, it's going to do it. And we're helpless on that level. So bring it down to what I can do. And that's just enjoy every day. That's all I have control over. And even that is not certain. Yeah. Yeah. The serenity prayer is uh, uh, what God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the uh, the courage to face the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> Most of the things well, look at it. we can't really change uh, that are out there in the world. Exactly. Look at it. March 13th, we hit a wall and nobody predicted this where everything that you knew on March 12th was out the window and still out the window for the most part. This is how quickly, on a dime, things can change and we act like we have all this time and we can do whatever we want to do and the way we're doing it and nothing's going to upset that here we are it's all upset and we have to learn that it is fragile and there's nothing you can do to change something that's beyond our grasp hmm. so uh, what's been something that uh you've come to terms with and and uh, think something that's been uh challenging or or uh, life changing that you've had to address, uh, like, you know, some, some, something maybe tragic or there's just so many things out there in the world and things can come, uh, 
hit us uh, from behind when we're, we're least expecting it and uh, hit hit close to home too. I'm curious if there's uh, something that you want to talk about that you see now, maybe even as a gift after the fact. I've always lived with the philosophy that nothing is guaranteed. And I think you're better off instead of pretending that you have all of this locked down, that you can control and do this at that point, and it will move to that point. And yeah, you can make plans, but things could be monkey wrenched. I go back to, again, our metal conference, and one of the members announced recently that he has cancer. And you could tell in his face that he's, he's scared, and rightly so. And I thought, and he was talking about how he had all these business things going on, and everything was looking bright, and then he gets the results back. And he finds he has cancer and things, he said, change now. All the business things are on the back burner. And now it's about getting his health straightened out. That's what I'm talking about, where it doesn't matter how you're going about things. There are unforeseen things that could disrupt those. And how do you manage those when they happen? And I've been through enough business-wise where you have to go to a Zen moment of, I can't force something. It's going to happen when it's supposed to happen. I believe in that organic way of doing things. I'm not saying I don't do anything. I'm just saying uh, you try your best. Hope it works. If it doesn't, put it in your energy into something else. It's all you can do. And that's only by the learning and doing and having the situations come up where you didn't expect them and then dealing with those. Because I've had moments where I thought there's no way this is going to change. And it changed on a dime and I had to adjust and I just figure, well, everybody goes through this. I don't think anybody escapes this. I don't think anybody gets a straight line of perfect all the way through their life. I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody that has had that. Maybe you have, please share. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) No, no, I don't care who they are. The biggest movie star, whatever person you look up to, they've had their share of crap. Yeah. And And it's universal. And the, the hard stuff is where you really grow the most. Exactly. Uh, it's not when you're on easy street where you're, you're evolving as a person. No, it's those challenges where you really have to find that new muscle that give you the strength to find something else. Or then you didn't know you had that strength. You wouldn't have found out if things kept going in the right direction or the so-called right direction or the same way. Yeah. Yeah, there's an uh, Indian proverb, very old one, that goes something like, he who has his health has a thousand wishes, and he who does not has just one. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And we kind of, as we're running and doing, we kind of forget that all the time. And I'm wondering if post-COVID that this lesson will stick. And I say that because you remember 9-11, and we said on 912, well, we're not going to put up with any nonsense anymore. We're not going to get into stupid stuff. We're going to be really on the important things. We're going to stay with the important things. That lasted, what, about three weeks? And we drifted right back to where, and maybe worse than we were pre-911. And I'm wondering if this one is going to stick, because this is, I think, more brutal. We didn't shut down after 9-11. People's livelihoods weren't entirely or much at all impacted. This is different. This is a lesson I think is going to stick. Hmm. So if if you were looked back on this time that we're going through now, let's say a decade into the future, what would you see is the, the biggest gift from this year? It's been a tough, horrible, hard year for many of us, but what would be uh, a silver lining or a gift that you see out of this? Well, I hope, and this one is a stretch, that people would treat each other better. Hmm. But the political scene in the United States is so torn and divisive. It's And to acknowledge a recent blog post, I have decided that, I hope I'm wrong again, that we are now living in an alternate country. We have two different countries, a parallel country where you got a big group of people that believe in one thing and people believe in another and they ain't getting together. And it ain't going to happen anytime soon if I could use ain't twice in one sentence. 
it just seems like we're locked down on that. I'm hoping that that dissipates and maybe it will in 10 years, but I just don't see it now. And that's disturbing because as they say, you're better united than divided and we're very divided and how much can be accomplished with this kind of division. You're going to have people going at it. And you talk about Thanksgiving, the lead up and before COVID pretty much backburnered a lot of plans, I could have just seen people getting together and having a few drinks and then going at it because the election results would still be up in the air to mm -hmm. some people. And that is, that's the go juice to get into fist fights and arguments. And these are with people that you normally got along very well with friends, family, whatever. I'm hearing of all these relationships that are completely shattered because of this political scene. Mm, That's yeah. what I'm hoping, geez, in 10 years, I hope it's in a year, but certainly in 10 years, we had gone through this phase and it, it showed its ugly head and we decided that's not the way to go and it's all calmed down. Yeah, but uh, do you see there, there's a gift in, in this whole uh, pandemic and economic downturn and everything? Do you see that? there is a silver lining here? I do see those people out there that are helping other people. And I think, yes, that really is the core of humanity. We're mm -hmm. not at each other's throats. We really do want to help each other. And I'm hoping that becomes the overall theme and the way we go about our lives. Yeah, I see that. I think we're going to come out of this and appreciate all those weird little small things that we never thought we'd have to give up being with people, being in restaurants, being in theaters, being at concerts, those things that we just took for granted as we do. And now you long for the days when you watch a movie or TV show and they're at a restaurant, you go, oh, restaurants, I remember those. Yeah. And it's, it's weird, it's funny, but it's weird that that now, that little simple thing is, is gone for now. You know, my wife and I used to love going to Trader Joe's together, go shopping. And uh, yeah, that of course went away with, uh, with the pandemic and having to go in with masks. And in the early days, people were much more uh, concerned about the virus potentially being on surfaces than they are now. So every single item we had to wipe down. Uh, before we put it in our fridge and stuff. And wow, the magic just disappeared <laughs> from, and, from those and, nice moments. Yeah. And the early on shortage of toilet paper and paper towels where there was no connection to the virus, to that. And you realize where people will react irrationally to something right away. And that's concerning because <laughs> what if things were really, really serious and what would people do? That's the way I'm looking at this. And we're going back and in the middle of, at this point, probably toilet paper rationing or paper towel ration, whatever it is, because people are hoarding again because the COVID numbers are going up. No connection, but there it is. Yeah. Right. It's pretty weird. It is pretty weird. Uh, but people are irrational and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, you said it. Yeah. Are there some poignant moments that you want to share that maybe you shared uh, on the radio about maybe your uh, your dad or your mom? I, th I think you did share a few things uh, over the years about your parents. Any stories uh, that you want to share now that well, you shared before? You probably are aware because you're a listener of my name theory where certain names will forecast what happens to you or what you'll end up doing. If you pay attention to that, you'll see, oh, yeah, of course that happened to them because their last name was automobile accident or whatever. I know that's not giving you the direct uh, connection that I'm talking about. Here, my parents' initials are AM and FM. I was destined. But uh, <laughs> now to your point about a poignant moment, I play this tape that my father made on Veterans Day every year. He recorded this about 37 years ago at his kitchen table on his little Panasonic tape recorder. He was recording a moment from World War II 
that he was recalling. He was in this battle on Christmas Eve during World War II. It's about 13, 14 minutes long, and he walks through the whole scenario, and it's riveting and frightening to think of him. He was probably 21 years old in this situation. And I play that, and the response is always very moving because people hear it, and some people say I was crying halfway through it because he thought he was going to die. And you just get a real moment of being in war and what war is, which is hell. And I was so glad he has, he had this tape. I have this tape now and he's dead. He's been dead for almost 30 years, but I can share this with the listeners every year. And we, I don't know if we take it for granted as much, but certainly after Vietnam, those veterans came back and were treated like nothing happened. And PTSD was finally discovered. Nobody knew about that in World War II. I remember one day my father was in bed, somebody slammed a door, he jumped up, he thought it was a hand grenade and he was reliving a moment in the war at that point. And when he had his heart attack, he was being rushed to the operating room and my mother was next to him and he turned to her and said, where's the hand grenade? He kept flashing back during those moments because those were the moments that scarred him. And these people that fight in these wars, I mean, they need any kind of assistance that we can give them because I can't imagine what that's like. I can imagine, but it probably doesn't come close. So that is something that I cherish, that, that tape. And my mother, I think I get a lot of my sense of humor from her because she's kind of goofy in that sense. She says things that are, that are pretty funny that I remember. And, and that combination of DNA is what, made me do what I do, I believe. Yeah. Cool. And, and have you heard any feedback from a listener who maybe had a breakthrough because they, they listened to, uh, that tape from, from your dad, like, uh, not just, you know, in tears, like, wow, that was really moving, but somebody's life was per permanently changed uh, for the, what I do here is people who have family, friends that were in World War II or Vietnam and were struggling. And they felt that they could connect because a lot of people then are experiencing this and they didn't feel alone or had some way to think, wow, I heard my uncle tell me these stories and he seemed like he didn't have anybody to talk to, but obviously other people have had this kind of trauma and are not alone. And I would get that. Or to extend that out a little bit, over the years, get letters before email from some listeners who were borderline suicidal or on their way to killing themselves and heard something that we said on the program. I said whatever that made them laugh. And that stopped the emotion of killing themselves, which that's pretty powerful yeah. to have that kind of impact. Yeah. I, you don't know who's listening and what their circumstance is. You're in your room doing this and it goes out and everybody's got their life spinning one way or another. And you don't know exactly. Sometimes you never hear, oftentimes you never hear from the listener as far as how it impacts them, but hopefully it gives them some kind of joy to pull them out of some situation that was pretty dark. Yeah. So if somebody's listening right now and they're feeling suicidal, because this has been a really rough year for many people. What would you tell this person? Well, again, Stefan, I go back to our metal conference. So see, this conference is so riveting and strong that I pull so much out of it. Recently, the host, Ken Rakowski, he does these surveys during the two hour session. And he said, of the several hundred of us assembled, how many of you have contemplated suicide? Now, these are people that are accomplished and at the top of their game. 51% said they had thought about suicide. And, and even Ken was taken aback by that because he thought it would be much lower in that everybody there seems to have the brain power to work through things. Therein lies the mystery of, hey, you don't know. You don't know what's going on in people's lives. And even those who are accomplished have moments of doubt or whatever. It gets better, hopefully. And I 
have a friend. He's a very successful restaurateur. And he told me one day, he said, and I'll never forget this. He said, what appears today could be quite different in two weeks. It might not be two weeks, but his, his phrase was, stay put if things aren't right now, things could change and we can see how fast things change for the better too, not just for the worse, but just go past that real dark moment and see if a week or two gives you more daylight. And that's what I would say. This is not the moment to make any rash decisions when you're really not thinking straight. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's when people take their life because they just go, eh, I, I can't get past this moment. Calm down, just stay with the thought that it could get better and it could get better quicker than you think. Yeah. So what would, would be uh, like a pearl of wisdom that you learned from whoever you know, in your life that yeah. you would want to share that we, we didn't talk about yet to, to oh, end here, this? Here, okay. I kind of go to, I always try to go for the joke. And I think my family is getting tired of my dinner conversations because they're doing something serious and I'm waiting for the moment to throw a joke in. And my recently my mother-in-law was sitting there and she threw a look at me like, is everything a joke to you? And I almost wanted to say, yeah, it is. Because that's the <laughs> only way I can cope with a lot of this stuff. I'm going to go to this. The Masters Golf Tournament was played in, well, it was played in November this year. Dustin Johnson was the winner. But about two days into the tournament, before he had won, a reporter asked him what his favorite thing about the Masters was at that moment, and he said the sandwiches. And I found that to be such a perfect response because this golf tournament is very elitist. And if you're not into golf, which I'm really not, but I know the whole atmosphere of Augusta and everything, and it's very, hey, we're a part of the club and you're not. To have this golfer say the best thing about the whole damn thing was the sandwiches. I thought it brought it down to a level of, yeah, it's all about the sandwiches, not only at Augusta, but isn't life all about the sandwiches? <laughs> life sort of is really all about gets the down sandwiches. to it. It's all about, really just have a good sandwich because everything else could just flare up and go south on you. And that's the best way to deal with life. Have a good sandwich and think about how you've had these better moments than you've had the worst moments. You just, I start going with, okay, let me get a category here and good. Yeah. It's bigger than the bad category. I'm good. Yep. Every day above ground is a win. Boom. <laughs> awesome. And uh, if folks wanted to listen to your podcast, where should we send them to? GaryMeyer.com. That's G-A-R-R-Y-M-E-I-E-R.com. And you'll find the back episodes there and my blog and everything else. And then, like I said, on Fridays, 6 p.m. Eastern, United States, that's a live show. And that's where we, and it's a cocktail show. We actually have cocktails because we need something at the end of the week. (laughs) All right. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, This was great and fun. And and, uh, yeah, you've made a lot of people laugh and smile over over the decades. and, uh, And thank you for that, for injecting humor and and liveliness and and fun into a lot of people's homes and lives i appreciate you saying that and the sad part stefan is even when i'm trying to be serious they laugh so what am i going to (laughs) do all right awesome thank you gary and thank you listener we'll catch you on the next episode of get yourself optimized i'm your host stefan spencer signing off